Hello, I'm Margaret Casely Hayford, and my talk is called Face into the Darkness in Our History. And we live in a world in which even statues can cast a long dark shadow because what they symbolise is contested. And in a brave new world, you wouldn't call me out for asking you to listen to me and have compassion, and you wouldn't call me woke for saying that identity matters. And I wouldn't cancel you out and say, I'm not listening because you appear to be too radical. Neither of us would be scared to be challenging or to be challenged. We'd feel comfortable to discuss and dispute as part of a safe learning process. And that was once the way that academic arguments matured anyway. But we lost something when we departed from that. And one might blame social media echo chambers or print media propaganda or Machiavellian nationalistic politicians. I don't really think it matters who's to blame. What's important is that we've lost trust. Can we ever recreate the environment in which that could flourish? For me, the context isn't identity, it's hurt. Rabindranath Tagore, the Hindu writer and poet, renounced a knighthood offered to him by the British, referring to a massacre in 1919. And in his rejection letter, he said that a badge of honour creates a glaring shame that's incongruous to the context of humiliation and degradation of others. And more recently, the writer of Jamaican heritage, Benjamin Zephaniah, declined his OBE for similar reasons. But two years ago, I accepted a CBE, but for reasons diametrically opposed to those of Tagore, because I feel that I owe it to the thousands of my forebears who were belittled, ignored, and whose amazing contributions were too often overlooked by history. Now, as Chancellor of Coventry University, in a way, to me, the way that the architect Basil Spence designed his new cathedral for the city mirrors that attitude because it looks at and acknowledges the ruins of the old bombed out cathedral. It gains strength from the ruins, doesn't forget the past, but builds on it, enabling us to gain context from understanding better the destruction caused by evil and the role that the unsung good played in our being where we are now and possibly for similar reasons to those that were involved in the Truth and Reconciliation Committees that were established in South Africa after the fall of apartheid. I like that juxtaposition. And John Donne said, no man is an island, meaning of course that no one exists in their own space alone or in their own time without impacting on others. And as chair of Shakespeare's Globe, it delights me that Shakespeare explored that in The Tempest, in which he placed Miranda and her father on an island in which Miranda had been brought up thinking that Prospero, her pa, and she were pretty much the only people on their own little island and the limita limitations of islander life and how much you benefit from interacting with others who've seen more are beautifully and poetically explored. But as a society, we tend to create monuments to certain people that establish a univalent perspective on the life of this celebrated person reflecting how that individual was viewed at the time the monument was created and the perspective then becomes literally cast in stone and stops evolving or maturing no matter what we subsequently learn as a society about that individual. So like Miranda on her island our views remain unsullied by any perspective from elsewhere so that we in effect cancel the opportunity of others to interfere with our world like someone who operates in their own little corner of the Twitter sphere and can't accommodate opposing views at all. But it's fair to ask, is there a harm in an unsullied innocence? In my view, an unchanging conservatism can cause harm. We only have to think about the way in which it was necessary after his death to rehabilitate the magnificent codebreaker Alan Turin, who had been driven to suicide by the prevailing societal norms that punished him for being gay. For us to understand the immense wrong that can be done by the stubbornness of society to recognise the folly of maintaining the status quo. The flip side of that coin is that society often unreasonably rigidly reveres some people for one part of their life, often wealth creation, and regardless of subsequent realisations that other activities more than severely tarnished their reputation, we stick to the point. Statues to slave owning or colonialist philanthropists are a clear example. So on what basis should we make revisions or think anew about our shared history? 
or review those whom we've celebrated or indeed seriously persecuted or underappreciated. Some of us in the academic world have become frightened of letting people onto our island because we want the teaching that we impart or receive, which might be seen as our education or even our actual monuments, like for example the statue of Cecil Rhodes that adorns the exterior of Oriel College, to be a testament to the people that we believe we are. But what if our original view was wrong? or at the very least too narrow? Or what if we have, as a society, matured? Shouldn't our teaching mature with us? And shouldn't our monuments be revisited so that we can assess how well they reflect who we really are or help us to understand why we no longer are what we believed ourselves to be? Is an examination of our context helpful to our growth or does it make us less confident about ourselves, as some would argue? In my view, building on facts should make us more confident. Isn't it right to examine a wider set of facts and to accept the challenge and the perspective of others that might help shape how we mature or how we view truth and how we deal with the inevitability of a change in our morality or political sophistication or awareness? Ironically, those in the academic world who seek to have curriculums widened are also Sometimes those who say they want a space in which to operate, in which they can cancel out others, disallowing them from taking a platform to debate more widely. And that, to me, is as damaging to debate as it is to deny a person the ability to bring the, the issue of the facets of their identity into the discussion or to refuse to accept arguments from them about the impact of their identity. Inev because identity inevitably has an impact on perspective. I mean, how much is a black or a female life allowed to matter in debate? Now, they say that writers, that, 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 that victors write history. It's also said that empires are doomed inevitably to fail. And whether that failure arises from the complacency of the victors or because of insurrection from the subjugated or more probably as a result of both, can either be avoided? If victors could hear and listen to the subjugated in order to understand their perspective better, would that make them less complacent? If they were less complacent, would they inevitably listen? And if they were listening, what should they want to hear? Let's examine the subject of the erection and retention of statues a bit further. Statues to great men, because they were almost invariably men. The complacent, would be, complacent view would be that they were and are great, leave them be. The Conservative would say they're an important part of the heritage, celebrate them for their legacy. And the Conservatives would say that they tell an important part of the story. The subjugated, on the other hand, such as slaves or the colonised, would have said they're a symbol of those that dominated and, and diminished us. And the sons and daughters of the subjugated would now point to the ways in which their ancestors, our ancestors, were denied rights or property in order for the individual to triumph. And they might say that their celebration is a continuation of the denial of the rights of their forebears, and that to celebrate the powerful without recognising the contribution of the subjugated is to limit the self-respect and dignity of those whose efforts contributed to or created the strength, success and power of those whose legacy is being celebrated. So let's try to hear and understand better why or how the great men might have been said to have had feet of clay so that we can do better. On rare occasions, public figures view their own actions and highlight their own feet of clay, but it's a rare individual who does that. And there is a chap that I would actually hold up as a good example of that rare individual. Judge Samuel Sewell was remarkable in terms of being one of the nine 17th century justices who was involved in the Salem witch trials but later publicly stated that he actually regretted his role and he even called for reparations. At the end of the trial Sewell's family experienced four family deaths within a short sp space of time and he thought that was a punishment from God and it thought, taught him to or told him to review his position and given that the trials had even involved the imprisonment of a four-year-old ch child it suggests that the judgments were unsound.
But he didn't actually change his view on the basis that witchcraft didn't exist. What he said was that he thought that his ruling had been based on inadequate evidence, and he wrote about how he would publicly confess his guilt. And I like the complexity of the man. It makes him really human. And uh, apart from the Salem witch trials, in fact, he was, he was liberal, or he showed a liberalism in other areas. So in 1700, for example, he railed against slavery, and that made him a very early colonial ab abolitionist. But he was far from a saint. He was a segregationist. He, but he did maintain, however, that, and I quote, these Ethiopians, black as they are, seeing their sons and daughters of the first Adam, ought to be treated with a respect, unquote. And he, he even wrote about the rights of women. So it's that complexity that I think that we should want to embrace in all our heroes. I also like the fact that he called um, Africans Ethiopians because it's a phrase that my, my grandfather used as, as um, a sort of metaphor for the whole of Africa when he wrote in 1911 a book called Ethiopia Unbound. And my grandfather, J.E. Case, Casey Hayford, wrote this book um, really as, as a, um, an exhortation that we should retell stories that create our history, recontextualizing and reflecting our life and our experience by recognizing the wider group of contributors to our shared history to help us to a better understanding of who we are and how we got there. And my grandfather's book takes the form of a, a novel that, that's semi-autobiographical and explores the relationship of a British colonialist and a West African from the time when they meet as undergraduates at Cambridge and later on when they um, bump into each other again in West Africa. And he is quite surprised at the fact that um, the, the white man has ex ex exhibits an innate feeling of superiority and unquestions this, uh, this feeling. And the book examines the way in which Western culture ignores and denigrates the culture of others in order to justify a social order that it tries to preserve. And J.E. Um, Casey Hayford exhorts Africans to educate ourselves about our own history and culture and be proud of our knowledge. And I'd go further than him and I would even ask that everyone aims to understand the way in which others' input and effort contributes to the knowledge and culture of the countries in which we live and work in order to give everyone the respect that we would want to have ourselves. And for that reason then, I say it's important not to shy away from contested histories. The adult thing to do is to face into the dark parts of history and strive to learn from them. And I think this should be the same approach whether we're talking about governing theses, whether we're talking about movements, whether we're talking about individuals such as Colston or Rhodes, both of whose complicated histories have caused their statues for years notoriously to be the subject of demands that they be removed. So we need to review, revise, listen and learn. And thanks to social media, unfortunately, and the tyranny of algorithms, we're all increasingly falling into a world that's as circumscribed as that of Miranda in Shakespeare's Tempest. In other words, we think that what we perceive is all that's true, but we're becoming algorithmically isolated in our little islands to our detriment. And the players are becoming increasingly narrow versions of ourselves. So we increasingly worship leaders that reflect morality and principles that we hold dear in our virtual island. And we become what's been termed superfans in the way of the superfan, um, which the writer Eusebius Mackaiser uses as a term to describe the people who, for example, voted for the African National Congress, the ANC, and um, at the time, rightly probably lauded their efforts because they were um, victors in the struggle against um, the evil apartheid regime. But then he says that the superfan celebrates their heroes regardless of whether there is evidence that some of them might subsequently de descend into corruption. And he actually says that the superfan's behaviour is mirrored in relation to many leaders in countries worldwide where people have seen them as saviours and subsequently refuse in the face of mounting evidence to see their limitations. 
And so the superfan becomes swept along by a growing tide of acceptance of the corruption and can be easily manipulated by truth spinning and unconstitutional behaviour. So he says, for example, you look at um, these leaders' um, increasing ability to perpetuate their own power thereby. Putin, he gives us examples, Modi, the Prime Minister of Belarusia, Bolsonaro, and Trump, of course. With that in mind, the grown-up thing to do then is to build truth on an understanding of a whole history and a whole identity. And that's as important for those in leadership as it is for the rest of us. The future requires us to look at each other with a horizontality that affords not only a look at who am I, but understands that in a wider context. So we're talking about a truthful realism that has a, an historic context. And knowledge, the knowledge then gives us confidence to recognise the contribution. And so, for example, it would give you an opportunity to criticise me if I deserved it, or to praise me when praise is due and earned. And so we should allow democratic spaces in which only if we're endangering life would be completely cancelled out, and in which the various elements of an identity may be respectfully present. So we're, we then erode the we and them environment and we empower people by allowing them to be part of the story, enabling the story and the contribution to be told in the way that my family knows of and celebrates its history because my grandfather, J. Casely Hayford, was a writer, a politician, has been recorded and reported. And so we understand and we gain a confidence from knowing of our contribution, both to British history and to West African society. And I would like that to be the way in which others are recognised and gain confidence in the lead. So we have, a, we have curation with perspective, curation with knowledge through arts and humanities, creating almost scientific like building blocks, which would and should give context and confidence to everyone within society. And as I said at the head of the talk, I'm Chancellor of Coventry University. So I officiate on in these wonderful graduation ceremonies standing in the cathedral and I'm given a chance when I look down the nave towards the bombed out ruins that are the past of the cathedral to look at the past, standing in the present, but looking at the, the new graduates who are undoubtedly the future, not just of the city, but also the university. And because they're young and they're cosmopolitan, also the future of this planet. And for me, that's deeply symbolic. So I encourage the students at every graduation to seek out facts, seek the truth, and really listen, and importantly, continue to learn. And so should we all.